Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the diff. We're just wrapping up week two. And after this session, live session today in the studio in Cows, we're going to take a couple of days of break, but we'll be back for a full week of live sessions coming on, becoming on Monday with uh, um, the uh, documentary that will look at the future of work by Azim Azar, and that's going to be very relevant for our conversation today because we are going to be talking about basic income, universal basic income. And I have in the studio with me Peter McCall, who is the head of policy for Scotland at Nesta, but who also has been um, looking at that idea of basic income for the past 15 years. He's very strong interest in the topic. And live from New York is Alma Zeleke, who's a political scientist and who notably teaches at New York University Shanghai campus. So welcome both of you. It's great to have you here uh, to talk about something which is very divisive, which has a lot of misconceptions attached to it. And maybe in order to get the, uh, the conversation started in the right way, I will ask each of you to give your own quick definition of what it is we're talking about when we're considering basic income. So maybe ladies first, should we go to New York for that? All right, um, very happy to be with both of you today. So a basic income, very broadly speaking, has three fundamental characteristics. It is unconditional, which means that it, is, uh, has, it has no pre or post receipts uh, constraints on behavior. It is individual, so it goes to individuals rather than households. And it is universal, which means that it's not means tested on uh, low income or, or low assets and is uh, you know, as broad uh, as it can be in a particular political community. Great. And Peter, if you, do you agree on this or do you have anything to add? So I'd very much agree that, that that's, a, that's a good description of what I understand a universal basic income to be. I think a good way of thinking about it is uh, certainly in the UK we have a state pension that uh, all retired people over a particular age and it's unfortunately going up at the moment but everybody who's retired gets uh, a, a state pension that allows them to live uh, comfortably in old age and that's if you were to, to, to take that and spread it out to the whole of the population that's, that's a good way of understanding what uh, universal basic income would look like. Why does the idea come to the fore at the moment? Is it really a question of uh, the robots are coming and therefore nobody will need to work? Wh why is it such a, a prominent topic? So I think there are a couple of things uh, at play here. Firstly, there's a process with social security and welfare where from the 1990s onwards, it's become more and more conditional. So people have been uh, in what uh, the Clinton administration in the States would have described as welfare to work programs. So the aim of social security is to get people into jobs. So th those, those programs have become very conditional and the UK certainly over the past eight or 10 years, we've seen a move to very, very, very conditional systems. And um, one of the reasons why Scotland has decided to do some pilots around universal basic income is because of that conditionality. So when uh, people in Fife went out and asked communities what uh, the, the main issues were, one of the key things was uh, benefit sanctions, so people having their benefits removed uh, because they uh, were only able to go to uh, an appointment or because they hadn't applied for enough jobs. So there's, there's a question about conditionality and the response to that has been to say, well, why do we have to have conditional benefit systems at all? Then there's a second set of arguments which are around creativity and around the, the, the changing nature of work. And the observation that, as I describe work in the future as, as having three characteristics, it'll be caring, creating, or it'll be about citizenship, so making decisions together. And those things are very difficult to monetize, they're very difficult to sell in the market, and therefore a universal income makes sense in that context. That's interesting because in all the three characteristics that you've described, it looks as though we're really post-industrial here. We're not producing stuff, we're not moving materials around. There's an element of caring and potentially remanufacturing can come into play, but it's definitely not extraction and production as we've known it. So in a way, it does challenge the misconception that people will be basically paid to do nothing, right? So I'll go back to you, Amaz, and talk us through how you personally would see that system uh, 
being implemented? What are your concrete recommendations for it? Sure. And, and let me just start by saying that um, in the United States, we've been dealing with the um, problems inherent in a conditional means tested safety net system since the 1960s. So in that sense, it's not a new problem for us. Basic income was considered in the 1960s and early 70s in the United States as well. So uh, why is it coming back now as a possible solution? I think that has to do a lot with um, the changing economy, as Peter said, but also with rising levels of uh, inequality in the United States and, and really around the world. So when I think about how basic income would be implemented in the United States, I'm thinking very um, uh, carefully about how to implement a system that would eliminate poverty and reduce inequality. Um, in the US, uh, we have, I think it's about the same poverty rates if we use the um, uh, relative poverty uh, measure as in the UK, about 20% of our population, 22% perhaps, um, lives under poverty um, as defined by relative poverty measures. And that's just ridiculous in um, advanced industrial wealthy countries to have that kind of persistent poverty, which we've had essentially since the 1960s as well, when we first defined poverty in the United States. So a basic income, uh, in, to my mind, should be attacking poverty, which of course holds back um, you know, a fifth of our population from really fully participating in the modern economy. And it should also attack inequality as well. Um, so I would argue for a basic income that goes to all uh, residents of a country, adults and children. I would argue for it to be um, paid to an amount that would bring families up to at least the absolute poverty level that we use in the United States. That's about $24,000 a year for a family of four um, in the U.S. And um, that it should be funded out of taxes on wealth rather than taxes on income. So you say tax the wealth, not tax the income, which is also a general uh, movement that looks at this and say tax resources don't tax labor because yes. labor is a renewable resource and it's creativity, you can tap into it. But at the moment, if you look at the, uh, the average in the uh, European Union, I think it's 52% of government income is through labor taxes. Mm -hmm. How does that work? How do you finance that system then, Peter? So I, I think there are a range of interesting things you could do here. So um, the UK is particularly bad at, uh, at taxing assets and asset wealth. Um, we, we don't really do uh, an inheritance tax. So if you look at almost all of the work on how it is that rich people get rich, the answer is because their parents were rich. Uh, and if you look at, you know, I mean, the President of the United States is a great example of that, the self-made man who is the billionaire son of a multimillionaire. Um, so finding ways to tax inheritance would, would, be, would be one of the ways to do that. Finding the ways to tax, to capture some of the increase in value in things like the housing market uh, in the UK. So house prices have risen very substantially. It's created a housing crisis for many people under 40. Uh, a lot of that income is totally unearned. Uh, you could take that and you could distribute it so that it gets to the people who really need it, the, the people who are uh, suffering from, from poverty and inequality at the moment. And that would allow you to, I think, create a, an economy where you have lots more creativity, where you have lots of people uh, undertaking caring rules that are very important in, in nurturing our, our children, our old people, nurturing uh, each other. Uh, and if you look at, I mean, if you look at things like the, the impact of inequality, so um, there's a fantastic book called The Spirit Level by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, which I'd recommend anyone reads, which tells you about just how damaging inequality is. So it does things like driving up uh, murder rates, assault rates, it, it, it increases early deaths from things like heart attacks and, and other uh, chronic health conditions. If we can move away from that inequality, we can live in a better society. And that's the prize here. So the prize is let's, let's deal with inequality, let's give everybody a basic level of income and a basic level of dignity that's universal, that, that, that doesn't require them uh, to jump through hoops, to turn up to appointments, to, to do things that, um, that, that, that aren't, they aren't necessarily able to do. And then you get the prize of a society that is healthier and happier. And if you can do that through taxing, and I, I, I would argue that you should tax assets, but you should also 
tax extraction, so where we have extractive industries, then I think that's that's a really good place to 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 go and raise taxes because those those are things that are a one off. You can't uh, you can't dig things out of the ground more than once and use them. Um, so that's that's a that's a really good place to to get these these resources as well. And of course, in the UK, we've seen over the past fifty years how we've largely wasted the resources we got from North Sea oil and gas. That's an interesting uh, point that you're making. But to go back on the opening statement uh, about taxing wealth, and especially unearned one, it's highly politically loaded, right? When on the back of that you're pushing basic income, do you actually shoot yourself in the foot by putting it into one specific political camp more so than another? And then I'll go to you, Almas, because that must be completely unpalatable in the U.S. at the moment. Yeah, it's, it is, I think, un, unpalatable at the U.S. at the moment, but we have to remember that there was a time when income taxes were completely unpalatable um, in the United States and were the subject of you know, quite very, very strong disagreements between um, different parties, and we eventually got an income tax in the United States moving away from tariffs uh, because we had increasing income, particularly in the northeastern part of the country, from industrial wealth. Um, so that's which you know taxation needs to go to where the money is um and so when money is uh uh you know, when the wealth of society is mostly in its land you'll have um you know contr contributions from people who own land and estates funding the government when you move to an industrial economy you'll have um income from wealth uh, uh sorry taxes from uh from income funding uh the government and when you move to a uh, post-industrial economy like we have with the tremendous amounts of um, income inequality and, and, and lots of wealth accumulation on the parts of uh, you know, the top 5 or 10% of society, then that's where you go um, for the money that you need to fund your government. So I think that one of the, the problems in the basic income conversation is that we often start with, well, how are we going to pay for it? There's not enough money, so we can't do it. I think instead we should think about what's the kind of society that we want and then think about how we pay for it. Uh, that's what we would do, you know, as a family. Uh, you think about what kind of life you want, what kind of home, uh, you know, what kind of job, and then you, you set out to try to make those things happen. So I think we should we should start with the the vision of the society that we want, and I very much agree with the one that that Peter described. And I think we're we're already there. You know, a lot of the conversation in the United States is about the robots are coming to you know take away all of the manufacturing jobs and the uh, low skilled service jobs and even some of the higher skilled service jobs. We don't have to wait for that future um, to come. We already have that that future now. That we have seen in the United States that um, increases in economic growth overall have not been shared with all workers equally. They've gone disproportionately to the top um, income and wealth holders. So it's it's not you know we're not taxing wealth or high incomes because we hate the rich um, or we're, we're jealous of them or envious of them. That's just where the money is. Yeah, and let's stick to that idea of uh, getting the society we want, because it's also uh, very important to recognize that the narrative of basic income uh, is hitting a psychological wall, which is, you know, it's been extremely entrenched over the past 200 years. Industrial revolution created an industrial model of education. Uh, the whole narrative is about go to school, get a job, contribute something, and your worth will be uh, measured against not necessarily the amount of money you have, but the, how meaningful your job is for the society. So does the idea stand a chance if we don't challenge those fundamental principles as well, Peter? I, that's a, I mean, that, that's a, that's a really good, a good point, and and I think um, I just wanted to pick up on one one thing from the last mm. uh, the last section, which was in 1945 we decided in the UK that we wanted a free. National Health Service, and it's the most cherished institution in the country. If you do a poll and you ask people what they like, the NHS finishes top in almost every poll. Uh, at that time, Britain was absolutely saddled with war debt. It uh, it had a smashed society, and yet it was able to do what people really wanted to do, which was to create a National Health Service. Uh, and, and, and that shows that you can do what you want to do when you need to do it if you've got the will. And, and that's, that then becomes possible. That, you know, everything in history is impossible until it happens. And once it's happened, it becomes inevitable. Um, and that, that's a really important thing, thing to, to hang on to. And to go back on the, uh, the fundamentals of what we get taught, what we get 
raised with in terms of narrative, is there a way for uh, basic income and the idea to integrate that? Because can it actually be bolted on the system as we know it without challenging the, those preconceptions? Does it, does it stand a chance if we don't go to the philosophical debate? And how do we go to the philosophical debate without shutting everybody off and actually making it engaging? So I, I think that I, I think that those those are those are really important points, and I think there's there's a thing here about what it is that we love doing. What is it that humans love doing? Uh, and a lot of critic critics of of universal basic income say people will be lazy. They'll be. Um, I, I did a did a media interview once where uh, a tabloid journalist described it as a layabouts charter. Uh, it's a quite colourful way of, de of describing what many people's fears are here. But actually, when you look at what people do, what they, what they do in, in their own time is things that are creative. So they do craft, they, do, they create things, they, they, they make uh, normally uh, beautiful items, or they, they spend their time learning music or learning, um, learning foreign languages or learning how to do something that, that, that they, can't, they can't do or, or consuming art and, and, and other things. And those are the things that actually make us more human. They relate very much to what our humanity is. And what we've been forced into doing is productivist jobs that are about um, creating things to be consumed when that consumption is not necessarily what it is that makes us human. And, and I think that's this is one of the ways that we can throw off those shackles. And I think we live in a world that's absolutely full of alienation, where, where everybody feels incredibly alienated. They hate their jobs, they hate, they hate work, they hate uh, the system that, that they're working in. That's why, we, that's why we have people voting for things like, like Brexit for, for, for Donald Trump. We need to find a way to get away from that. And I think a universal basic income isn't all of that, but that's one of the key planks to this. It's one of the ways in which we can really get people to focus on what it is that makes them happy and that makes those around them happy. And when we have happy people, we have a better world. So could we simplify to the extreme and say, we're coming to the certain end of the industrial society. Of course, it still has a lot of uh, a profit to extract and it still can go quite a long way. But we could say, you know, most of it has been built. What we need, we have in terms of material comfort. Is, isn't it time now to let the, uh, the machines take over the boring and degrading work and move to a society which is more about innovation, creativity, and basically trying to do good rather than do less bad? So there's, a, there's an analogy with the material world here as well. Is, is that something that would be palatable, you think, Almaz? I do, and I think that um, it's instructive to think about the different kinds of values that um, underpin different sorts of societies. So if we think back to um, the feudal uh, societies um, that, uh, that we said goodbye to when we moved into industrial capitalism, they were really based on authority and loyalty. Right? You, had, you had a duty um, to your, your king, to your landlord, um, uh, to your church. And that, those, that was really sort of the fundamental value in society. When we moved to an industrial society, we moved to one where the value of, of competition um, and uh, individual incentive uh, was really prioritized. So I think now in the service economy and the, the post-industrial economy that we find ourselves in and the creativity economy that we should be moving into, the value should really be on cooperation and collaboration. So we need a, an economic structure that supports that. And I think one way to move beyond some of the polarization that you find when you, when you talk about basic income uh, to non-experts is to think about the, uh, the ways in which our economy is already built on cooperation and collaboration and think about not you know, completely eliminate, eliminating competition and um, incentives to, uh, for individual gain, but to think about shifting the balance more in the direction of cooperation. So when you look at basic income from a, a gender or feminist perspective, um, you know you see that, as Peter's been alluding to from the beginning, uh, a lot of the very important work in society um, is caring work, and that's not paid for at all in the in the market. So we all already belong to families and communities and societies where uh, we have unconditional, individualized, um, in, you know, universal 
care that we provide to each other. And that's what allows us to participate in the more competitive market economy. So we still want to maintain both as we move forward into the, the new economy of the future. But it's, it, it seems like we'll all be better off if we move a little bit more in the direction of emphasizing collaboration and cooperation over competition. So in, in terms of basic income, that means a flat uh, you know, foundation of economic security on which you can build with market incomes, um, with, uh, you know, with, with earned income from work, so that there is always an incentive to go out there and work to earn more, but nobody falls below that um, basic level of subsistence that allows them to uh, care for themselves, care for others, um, to invest in the kinds of skills um, and practices that will be useful and productive in the, um, in the economy of the future. That's very interesting because it, it touches upon the, the enormous amount of unpaid and unvalued work that is being done every day by you, I, and, and every other citizen, which is uh, really uh, the same thing that if you look at the, the way we don't value ecosystem services or natural capital, which has been a massive flaw in the accounting of the economy as it stands. So why go unconditional and why not in terms of narrative say that uh, in order to introduce that basic income, we tie to the uh, intangible things that people do every day. So there's still that notion of retribution that we've been taught to live with. Peter, what do you think? So I, I think, I mean, I mean, it's really interesting. So economists have tried to put pricing mechanisms into all sorts of different areas of things that, that don't naturally lend themselves to market exchange. Uh, and generally, it's not terribly successful. And, and I mean, I think if you if you look at a lot of the financialization that led to the crash ten years ago in two thousand and eight, th th those are those are great examples of where the application of market principles into things like risk becomes very difficult. Um, and you know, there is an interesting debate about natural capital. And my argument around nat natural capital is always that we should try not to bring those things into the market because once you bring them into the market and financialize them, it, it, it becomes very clear that things have a price. And, and in some cases, that means that things will be destroyed because their price isn't, isn't high enough. Well, that's, to... that's exactly what's happening. A lot of things are, are being destroyed because they don't have a price. So you could look at it both ways as well, because we don't value it. That's then, you know, it, it's free for everybody to uh, either over exploit or pollute. And, th and that is a really interesting argument. Um, but I mean, I, I think it's really interesting. I mean, we've, we've known that domestic work, and um, domestic work is overwhelmingly done by women, uh, has not been paid, has not been uh, remunerated in the entire industrial age. So all other work has, has come into remuneration and we've never got to finding a way to put, to put, to put a pricing mechanism into domestic work. Now there's a question, do we, do we try and price domestic work? Do we try and price the quality of care? What, what caring you know, is, is changing a nappy, uh, something that, that should be paid more than spending an hour looking after a child where you haven't changed a nappy? You know, there, there, there are questions there around that. My feeling about it is that what we should do is give people basic dignity, is to give them the ability to care, not on the basis of exactly what tasks it is they've undertaken, but on the basis that that's what they do as humans. Mm. And I think that that gets us in, into a society that is about the fundamentals of being human and, and having human rights, rather than about trying to marketize care in a way that when we do do it, uh, you know, in this country we have domiciliary care where you have people paid to go and do a, a home visit that lasts for 15 minutes and in which there's a, there's a set task list of things that get done. And that's not something that makes either the people delivering the care or the people receiving the care feel terribly good about it. And that, that suggests to me that it would be much better to have a society in which care is given freely on the basis that everybody has dignity. That's very interesting. Before we move on to looking at the experiments and what's been done so far and how we can progress on the implementation of that idea, we're just going to take a look at what's coming up next in the diff. Hi, my name is Leo, and here's a little taster of things to come at the diff. If you're enjoying this session, you won't want to miss the live on-air session titled Artificial Intelligence, The End of Labour and the Evolution of Humanity. This goes live on Monday the 19th of November at 12 o'clock UK time, 
and speakers Michael Burns and Tamara Van Helm will be exploring just why they think artificial intelligence is the game changer. And while this session is the last live session of the day, and of the second week of the diff for that matter, we'll be back in the live studio on Monday with the session Holding It All Together where we will be joined by the scientific director of Solvay, who will tell us what excites them about the circular economy. And just to remind you all that there are around 80 pieces of content and counting up on the thinkdiff.co schedule, ready for you to get your teeth into. Yesterday, we released System Reset, a feature-length documentary produced by our very own Diff team. In it, leading thinkers in materials, economics, the commons movement, fab labs, digital citizenship, urban planning and architecture weave a picture of how our economy could operate to be fit for the 21st century. And that's it from me, back to you in the studio. Some pretty intense stuff for next week then, uh, but we're not done here. I would like to uh, move up to Finland. Finland is a very interesting country. They had the first circular economy roadmap that was published very progressive, they have a national innovation fund, and they are willing to experiment. And they've notably experimented with basic income. So they took a group of 2,000 unemployed people, and I know that uh, it, it also conditions the experiment to, certain, to a certain extent. They uh, have allocated to these people 560 euros a month, so not all the results are uh, actually uh, published yet. We don't really know what it yields. But interestingly, Alma, as we were talking earlier about the fact that um, even about the experiment itself, there is a misconception because when you look online, a lot of the stuff that comes up is uh, the Finnish experiment has failed. It's not true. It's not even finished. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure why um, that is the case, but um, I, I think that the, um, it, it may be a, a result of the fact that when these pilots are undertaken, there is a desire for um, quick results. We want to know what's, what's happening right away. I think it's a little bit of a misconception about the effect of a basic income. I think there are going to be overnight effects on um, individuals or families or societies, particularly from short-term pilots. This pilot is um, scheduled to be two years long um, because the, uh, it, it, there, there's going to be an adjustment period as we adjust to a society without economic insecurity, as we adjust to a society without poverty, as we gain more control over our, over our time and the way we use our time and the way we think about our time over the course of our lifetime. So um, I think there's always a desire for uh, you know, quick results, um, but that's just not going to happen uh, coming out of these pilots. Peter, any comments with regards to the uh, experiments that I understand are either going ahead or are going to go ahead in Scotland? in cities specifically? So, um, so there are four areas of Scotland that have expressed an interest in universal basic income pilots. Two of them are cities, Edinburgh and Glasgow, which are the, the two largest cities. And there are two areas which are in their uh, kind of hinterland. So there's, so there's Fife uh, and North Ayrshire. Um, both, all, all of those have, have expressed an interest in, in doing a pilot. And this came out of some work in Fife around, uh, so um, West Fife's a former coal mining area. And there's, a, there's an endowment for coal mining communities called uh, uh, the Coalfields Regeneration Trust. Uh, and they did a big participatory exercise on what it was that uh, people wanted. Uh, and some of that was about community centres and, uh, and other facilities for their community. But they, they, they cast the, the net wider than that. They did a big participatory process. And the thing that came back that uh, people were most concerned about was uh, economic security, the impact of uh, welfare cuts, the impact of benefit sanctions, and out of that process, uh, a number of a number of organisations, including Carnegie UK Trust, spent some time working with people to identify how they might overcome that. And the the thing that they came up with was a universal basic income pilot. And they've managed to convince Scottish government that it's a good idea to, to pilot that. And of course, this happens in the context that everyone in Britain will be aware of uh, the, the introduction of universal credit, which is a single uh, benefit payable at household level. 
uh, and that, uh, that process has been very difficult. It's been extremely problematic. Uh, we've had uh, numerous delays in the implementation of that process. And I think a lot of people have thought that this might not be a success. When it's, when it's finally ruled out, we might have a, a welfare system, or, uh, what we might have known previously as a social, social security system, that doesn't work. And we need to think about what would come next. And I think a lot of the thinking in this is that a universal basic income might be the thing that comes next. And if, if universal credit fails, then a universal basic income might be the thing that we would want to do, particularly in the face of automating, automation of jobs. And I noticed that the Google car company, Waymo, is launching in the United States next month. Um, so we, we, we may be getting to the automation of a lot of jobs in driving, for instance, very quickly. Um, and so, so there's, been a, there's been a determination to do some experiments. Now, the nature of those experiments hasn't been defined yet, but it is in the programme for government, the Scottish Government's programme for government, and we're moving forward with that. Uh, I expect something to happen over the next two or three years, and, and we'll see what the, uh, what the outcome is. There, there are a couple of approaches that people have suggested taking. So one is the sort of randomised control trial approach, where you pick individuals you give them uh, a, a universal basic income for a period of years, two or three years. There's another which is about picking particular localities and doing it in a locality. And obviously the effects of those would be, would be quite different. We now have the ability with, uh, the, uh, with big data to understand cohort studies better than perhaps we could have done before. And some of the, some of the work on the Alberta negative uh, income uh, tax schemes of the 1970s is only just being done now because there was so much data and they couldn't process it at the time. So we now have the opportunity to use to use the data processing power we have to, to do some of those randomised control trial approaches. But I think there's a there's a real willingness to have an area based approach to pick a particular place and see how it makes a difference because then you get the community effects that you might have from a universal basic income. And if we look at some uh, big trends, uh, Almas, especially in the US, the, uh, the gig economy, how does that articulate with basic income? And does, in a way, which is probably not in intended, but could we think that UBI uh, facilitate the gig economy, make it more stable, perpetuated for better or worse? Yes, absolutely. And I think that that's um, part of both the support and the opposition to basic income in the United States is, is thinking that the gig economy is actually a bad thing for most workers uh, because it uh, substitutes uh, you know, a full-time job with benefits and you know, some degree of job protection for these pickup jobs that um, are you know, very insecure and come with no benefits, no pensions, things like that. Uh, so some people see basic income as hush money for um, people who are going to be the losers in that kind of economy to just um, you know take the money and, and not push for a, a more inclusive economy, whereas other people see it as the foundation for more of us to engage in, if not exactly the gig economy, in the kind of um, work life that uh, most of us are likely to participate in in the future anyway, in which we don't have one full-time, lifelong job with one you know, factory for the you know, 40 years of our life before we retire, um, but where we are moving in and out of work and training and education, care work, um, you know, et cetera, and want a little bit more flexibility. And then this could give us, basically, it could give us the, the foundation of economic security as we move in and out of different um, stages of work and education and training throughout our lives. When we've been talking, I've been completely ignoring the questions that have come online, which is terrible, but uh, there are a few. I'll pick a very short one because some of them look like uh, proper essays. Uh, question from Pat. There have been some trials of basic income. Finland, I think we've gone into that. Uh, so there is another one that says, not everybody shares your values, enjoying art, playing music, even caring. How do you convince them that basic income, money for nothing, is worthwhile? So I think it's, I mean, it's not just about playing music or, or enjoying art. I mean, I noticed that most software or, or a substantial amounts of software is produced uh, for good. People, people produce code, they put it on GitHub, and other people pick it up and use it for no, uh, for no fee. 
there are lots and lots of things that people will do if given the security to go and do it. And that's really what, what I'm saying is that um, in an economy where it's very difficult to connect uh, exchange value with uh, activity, uh, with labour, then it becomes uh, much more much easier to understand how a universal payment would allow people to have the dignity, to have the time, to have the opportunity to do the things that they do best. And I would much rather that people, uh, if they were really, really great coders, uh, produce code for social good. And I think there's a huge opportunity in that. At the moment, uh, it's very, very difficult to get funded to do something that's not easy to grow, that's not easy to monetize. Uh, we, could, we could do great things in the world if people had the security to do that. So yes, people don't share my values, mm. but what I think we do share is a common humanity and we also share uh, a, a system where it's not necessarily easy to get recompense for doing the right thing. And this would allow us to give people the security to do the right thing. And maybe it's important as well to uh, state the, uh, the obvious, which is not everybody is going to become super rich uh, as a result, we're talking about a, a limited amount of money, right? Which is interesting as well, because it might be limited, but if it's universal, we're talking big, big pots. And there's something that I've been wondering as well. Casper is asking, what effect would that have on inflation? Why put even more money when you could look at it and say, if it's about decency and dignity, let's look at what the biggest expenditure are for individual and maybe then have access to free housing as opposed to hand out money. Is that equivalent? Yeah. That's, that's a great question. Um, I think that uh, it, it raises the question of uh, what the alternative to a basic income is, right? So often when, when we hear criticism of a basic income, it's, it's kind of in, in isolation. So if we're all agreed that we need some kind of safety net um, in society, some kind of foundation of economic security, then the question is, should it be conditional or unconditional? Should it be means tested or universal? Should it be in cash or in kind? And I think on all of these um, metrics, uh, basic income comes out to be superior to um, the, the alternatives. Um, and that is, is partly because if you think of, of the way Peter characterizes um, you know, the economy as, as being a, in, about creativity, and there's one way of interpreting that, which is about you know funding poets and, and songwriters and so on. The other is to think about where does innovation actually come from in today's economy? Where does economic growth actually come from? And it actually comes from individual innovation and individual um, uh, entrepreneurship, and less in, in our economy now from large scale um, industrial enterprises that require either government or big capitalists to get involved. So it's, it's, it's more in line with the economy that we have now to say, let's give everybody a little seed money to try something and um, see where it goes. And the, you know, if there's failure, the failure is not at the cost of immiseration um, and starvation. The failure is, okay, well, I didn't get, I didn't strike it rich on this idea, but I still have my basic income to rely on. Now, in terms of inflation, um, inflation comes about when we print money uh, to fund things, you know, out of debt rather than um, out of the money that we already have. The way I think of a basic income is it should be a redistribution of resources from the wealthy who typically don't um, spend a very high proportion of their income or assets to those lower down the income scale who are more likely to spend their money and who are more likely to spend their money in local economies. So the other aspect of a basic income is that it encourages um, the investment in uh, more local economies and it gives people, individuals and, and communities a say in what their economies look like. They have money with which they can vote in a sense for the economy that they want. And um, particularly when we're facing a uh, you know, crisis of sustainability um, in terms of you know, the climate and our environment, um, you know, it makes sense to think about uh, not putting the uh, emphasis on total economic growth, but on smarter growth. And I think that really has to happen at the local level. And that's something that basic income would um, encourage and support. You could also argue, and, and some people do, that uh, individual innovation is where the growth comes from. And certainly the, the successes of the Silicon Valley and the unicorns and all of that tend to prove that. But they also reinforce the narrative of, 
you know, you have to work hard, have a good idea, sell it, scale it. And, and therefore, it's still a, a free market economy and that UBI is irrelevant. So, Well, I, I mean, I, I just wanted to pick up on one question from, from the pre previous bit, which is about inflation, which is if you tax assets uh, uh, in order to redistribute the, re redistribute the wealth into a, into a universal basic income, that will help you with inflation. So if you were to tax, for instance, uh, the unearned growth in uh, house values, you would reduce the value of housing and therefore reduce the, the tendency towards inflation in, in rents, for instance. Um, I think the, the question about Silicon Valley is really interesting and Silicon Valley is where the other set of people who are interested in universal basic income are. Um, and they're interested in universal basic income because they see technology destroying incomes and they want people to have an income to be able to buy things. And I think that's a really interesting... Buy uh, things that robots will make then. Uh, or software, yeah. So, so things that, that aren't material products. So um, there, there are a number of people in, in Silicon Valley who have a real interest in, in universal basic income, not for the reasons I'm interested in it, but, but, mm. but in order to maintain the market. I think that's, that's a really interesting question as well, because as we move away from the remuneration of, of what is effectively sweat labor, towards remuneration of other forms of labour, it becomes very difficult to see exactly how that economy will work. The last thing I would say is that um, the people who invented for Westerners the way in which we see the world were Greeks who had slaves doing all of the work for them so that they could think about uh, how the world works, they could write uh, the first plays, they could write the first meaningful music. Um, and if we could all do that, then I think we would all be producing those works of genius. And, and I think that's a really exciting prospect for us. If we can unleash that great human uh, well of creativity and knowledge and, and, and analysis, then I think the prizes there are enormous. And I think we tie ourselves down with uh, uh, labour that, that, is, that is low value when we should be doing uh, the, the things that really human, only humans can do that are about understanding the universe and understanding uh, how it is we exist as people. So if we were less busy digging holes, we might be inventing the second version of the democracy or a new golden age, is that what you're saying? I think that's absolutely true and I think our democracy needs an awful lot of work at the moment and I think <laughs> nobody, nobody would argue with that and I think, I think that's, that's one of the things we really do need to spend our time on. Right, so we have a couple of minutes, uh, and it's a bit of a challenge, but uh, somebody is asking, is, Michelle is asking, to be fair to her, in a panelist's opinion, will basic income happen? And you each have one minute to answer that. Amaz. Yes, it will happen because it, uh, it needs to happen to support the, the, the world um, as it's evolving now. And I think that we should, uh, as Peter said earlier, think back to all of the achievements um, of the last couple of centuries in particular in, in terms of the extension of democracy um, and uh, you know, suffrage to women and equal rights for minorities, um, abolition of slavery. I mean, these were all things that were thought to be impossible. And when enough people thought that they were uh, not only possible but necessary, they changed. So I think that it's, it's certainly possible to... Uh, implement a basic income if we all agree that it's the right thing to do. Peter? I absolutely think that somewhere in the world is going to adopt a uh, universal basic income at some point and it will be really interesting to see uh, exactly what the repercussions of that are for our political systems, for our economic systems and whether this is taken up like the uh, man manufacturing uh, initiatives in England in the in the 18th century, or uh, like the democratic uh, uh, innovations in, uh, in in all sorts of places around the world in the early early 20th century. I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens at, at that point, because I think it's something that will either become a complete success, or it will be pushed back into its box. I really uh, want to thank you both. It's been super interesting. Of course, we haven't gone through everything and there's still a lot to talk about. The idea was not necessarily to get people to either say yes I'm for or against but to understand the issue because it's massively complicated and there is a lot of uh, misinformation out there about it. So thank you very much for your work on this and for clarifying things.
Um, that's it for us uh, in the studio here in Cowes. Uh, today is the last session of the day, this afternoon. Uh, we encourage you to step away from your screens this weekend unless you're catching up on the diff. And we will see you back on Monday right here in the studio. Thank you.